In Russia today, the Tsar's four daughters, Olga, Tatiana, Maria, and Anastasia, have literally become icons, and are worshipped as holy martyrs. The first program in this two-part series will tell their story in their own words. My whole body shakes. I love him, I want to fling myself at him. In 1913, Tsar Nicholas II and his family celebrated 300 years of Romanov rule. The lavish state occasions of the Tercentenary were designed to show off the enduring power and imperial might of this ancient dynasty. But at the heart of this virtually medieval monarchy was a surprisingly modest family. The Tercentenary offered the public a rare glimpse of their royals, and the crowds were captivated by the sight of the Tsar's four daughters. In their identical white dresses and matching hats, the girls were picture-perfect princesses. These four princesses have an enduring fascination because they died young, unmarried, virginal, and they remain a symbol of innocence, and untainted beauty. Little was known about them at the time. They were viewed with fascination because they appeared so beautiful, almost like fairy tale princesses. There's an inherent similarity with Princess Diana, being the most photographed princesses of their time. The most marriageable, attractive, desirable, young royal princesses in Europe. Undoubtedly, the main figure in the lives of the four sisters was their mother Alexandra. Alexandra's story began a world away from the pomp and ceremony of Imperial Russia, in the tiny German Duchy of Hessen by Rhine. On her maternal side, she boasted impeccable royal credentials. Her mother was Princess Alice, Queen Victoria's second daughter. By contrast, her good-looking father, the Grand Duke Louis, came some way down the royal pecking order. They were a happy and close-knit family, but in 1878, they suffered a double tragedy, when diphtheria killed both Alexandra's little sister May and her beloved mother Alice. Alexandra was just six at the time, and profoundly traumatized by their deaths. She was always very shy, which didn't help things, but the death of her mother and her sister, really did have a change in her personality. That was the start of her deep introspection. In the nursery she was alone. She didn't even have her familiar toys around because they'd been burned or taken away to be disinfected. So, there was a huge cloud of mourning over her childhood. In the wake of Alice's untimely death, Alexandra's grandmother, Queen Victoria, stepped into the breach and took a very hands-on role in her grandchildren's upbringing, with Alex in particular, because she was so young. When her mother died, Queen Victoria took her on as her own. And she really did take on the role of surrogate mother in a very serious and determined manner. She had the nurse prepare monthly reports on what Alex and the girls were doing. She would go through all of the points and she would initial them. It was a very close, very loving relationship. Alexandra was raised in her grandmother's image with the same solidly English tastes and strict Victorian morality. She was very English. It's often said she was the German woman, but actually her Englishness, was her most pronounced sort of characteristic, as she had been brought up in a very English manner. In 1884, when she was 12 years old, Alexandra visited St. Petersburg for her eldest sister's wedding. There, she met Nicholas, the 16-year-old son, and heir of Tsar Alexander III. Nicholas would one day be the absolute ruler of one-sixth of the Earth's surface and the richest monarch in the world. Other dynasties paled into insignificance next, to the Romanov dynasty. As royal matches went, 
the Tsar Tubi, was the greatest prize going. Within a few years, the pair were head over heels in love. However, neither Alexandra's grandmother, nor Nicholas's parents considered it a match made in heaven. The Queen was very concerned when Alexandra announced she wanted to marry Nikki, the future Tsar of Russia. She was terribly worried about Russia, which seemed a very long away place, very alien, and very unsettled. That throne seemed almost dangerous to occupy. Nicholas's parents seriously did not like anything German. They didn't like Germany, they didn't want this modest, shy, awkward German princess, marrying the heir to this vast empire. They wanted a much bigger catch. At the end of the 19th century, Russia was a vast empire caught between the medieval and the modern. Serfdom had been abolished 30 years earlier, but most Russians continued to work the land and live in grinding poverty. At the same time, rapid industrialization was transforming the country, though the imperial regime seemed unable to keep up with the dizzying pace of change. Whilst the might of Europe's other monarchies had waned, Nicholas would inherit the same absolute power as every Tsar had wielded for the past 300 years. And in the autumn of 1894, the future Tsar found himself put to the test far sooner than expected. Whilst visiting his new fiancée in Germany, Nicholas was suddenly summoned home to his father's sickbed. Alexander had been taken ill with a disease of the kidneys, and died on the 28th of October, leaving his son utterly distraught. Just a week after he buried his father, Nicholas married Alexandra in a lavish ceremony at the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg. The couple shared a uniquely strong love which helped them through all their trials in life. That was especially important for Alexandra because far from home, at this foreign court, she found little comfort other than in Nicholas's arms. Alexandra had a pretty tough time when she first arrived at the Russian imperial court. One has to remember that it happened far more quickly than she anticipated or desired. Her hope was that she would learn Russian, she would learn about Russian orthodoxy, and how the court worked. However, what happened was that Nicholas was catapulted onto the throne and Alex was suddenly called to Russia. They got immediately married, and there was no preparation. Alex only knew a little bit of Russian when she arrived. The Russian call was incredibly opulent. The protocol was rigid. There were rules, and rules were not bent. These rules could not be broken. In this world of unimaginable access and unbearable rigmarole, Alexandra completely lost her bearings. She came from a very modest, little German backwater, and here she was in the center of St. Petersburg society, and she couldn't cope with it. She was the kind of person who if he got something wrong, would be mortified. And her remedy was to run away, to have a headache and retire to her bedroom. To make matters worse, Nicholas's mother the Dowager Empress Marie had set her daughter-in-law, a daunting example to live up to. For Alexandra, her glamorous, highly sociable mother-in-law, was a constant reminder of everything she was not. The Dowager Empress's view was that an Empress had to be visible. That was her job, she should be out there in society, shaking hands, smiling at receptions and balls, and doing all the things an Empress of Russia should do, which she, of course, had done with supreme confidence. But Alexandra was not like Marie. And the Dowager Empress was very annoyed and disgruntled that her daughter-in-law was not, as she saw it, fulfilling her proper function. The Russian court was totally unimpressed with Alexandra. They talked and they laughed, and they sent her up behind her back. She was regarded as gauche, as awkward, as badly dressed. On the other hand, Alexandra didn't go out of her way to try and change that, she retreated even more. Nicholas and Alexandra found sanctuary from the demands of court life, at Sarskoi Selo, 
a series of royal residences secluded in a beautiful parkland, which lay 15 miles south of the capital. This imperial haven had been a favorite of Catherine the Great, who had added the Chinese pagodas and bridges, which gave the place the air of an enchanted fairyland. Here, the couple's attention was focused much closer to home. On the 15th of November 1895, Alexandra had given birth to their first child, Olga. Two years later, another daughter, Tatiana was born, and two years after that, a third daughter, Maria arrived. Far from subscribing to Victorian stereotype, and leaving their offspring to be brought up by maids and governesses, the emperor and empress were determined to raise their children, themselves. Alexandra had a very clear plan in her mind of what family life was going to be, and that included private mothering, which meant she breastfed them, something that was unheard of in Russian aristocratic circles. People were appalled when they discovered that the empress of Russia was breastfeeding her children. But any criticism fell on deaf ears. The empress knew best how to raise her girls. In the royal nursery, Alexandra disregarded the eye-watering wealth of the Romanovs, and displayed a very unimpaired zeal for economizing. She saw to it that her girls had the same modest relatively Spartan upbringing as she had had. They tidy their rooms, they made their beds, cold baths in the morning. She'd never for a moment spoiled them. They had hand-me-downs, each passed on her clothes to the next one. They had very modest amounts of pocket money, they lead very simple and unostentatious lives. Nowhere is the amount of surprisingly ordinary and down-to-earth lifestyle more apparent than in their remarkable private family photographs, which capture royalty at its most relaxed. These were probably the most photographed royal princesses in history, even more so than the British royals, who took an awful lot of pictures of themselves, because they all had box brownie cameras and they were constantly snapping each other. The wonderful fascination about those girls is you see them, not just as royal princesses. You see them as an informal family group, loving, laughing, sharing things, making pratfalls in the sand. You see them as normal human beings. Although Nicholas and Alexandra were delighted with their little princesses, there was no escaping the fact that the Tsarina had so far failed in her most crucial duty as Empress, providing her husband with a son and successor. The Romanov rules of succession were of the strictest in Europe, in terms of insisting on the eldest son taking over and not allowing any choice in the matter. Therefore, there was huge pressure on Alexandra to bear a son. There was surely great rejoicing when Olga the oldest daughter was born. Not quite so delighted when the second and third children were also daughters. On the 5th of June 1901, Alexandra gave birth to her fourth child, but instead of the longed-for son and heir, it was another daughter, Anastasia. The four girls referred to themselves as Otma, from the initial letters of their four names. But behind the convenient acronym and the identical outfits, four very different personalities were taking shape. Olga was the most sensitive of the four daughters. She was very independent, very strong-minded, shy, and compassionate. Tatiana was a beautiful enigma. She was sphinx-like in her beauty, with those gorgeous aristocratic features. But there was something very closed off about her. She was very reserved like her mother, very dutiful, 
very good at organizing and getting things done, so much so, that her sisters found her bossy and called her the governess. Then there was Maria. Her sisters used to be slightly cruel to her and call her names. But she had a wonderful generosity of spirit that was quite her own. In fact, at one point, Nicola said of her that he was worried she was almost too perfect, so he liked to be told when she actually was naughty. Anastasia was the mischievous one. She was the one that would play the prank. She was the one that would stick her tongue out behind people's backs. She was the tomboy. On July 30, 1904, Nicholas and Alexandra's luck finally seemed to change. That afternoon, the cannon of the Peter and Paul Fortress fired a 301-gun salute to announce the birth of a son and heir, Alexei. The capital streets erupted in celebrations, and the sound of church bells was almost deafening. But the imperial couple's joy was very short-lived. Almost immediately after his birth, there was bleeding from Alexei's navel, and his mother's worst nightmare began to unfold before her very eyes. Shortly after Alexei's birth, she took one of her ladies aside, absolutely distraught, and weeping. She said to her, You don't know how much I have been praying, for our child would not have our inherited curse. That's what she called it. She had clearly, throughout that pregnancy, been longing for a son, yet dreading that this boy she'd been waiting for, for nearly ten years, might have hemophilia. The Tsarina had inherited haemophilia from her mother Princess Alice, who in turn had inherited it from her mother Queen Victoria. They didn't know why it happened. They couldn't test blood for it. They had no way of confirming the diagnosis, and most critically of all, they didn't have any way to treat it. Up until about 1950, it was regarded as an early death sentence. The mean age of death of a young man with severe haemophilia was 16. What made it even more difficult for Alexandra to cope with, was that nobody could know that the boy suffered from haemophilia. That would have meant that this was a boy with bad blood, and it was something that would not be getting down to Alexandra's credit in any way. They could not have an imperfect heir on the throne, because it reflected on the dynasty, and it was an ill omen. Alexandra would forever live in the shadow of her son's illness. But Alexei's birth also transformed the lives of his four sisters. The girls lost their places in the family hierarchy. From now on, they would always take second place to their little brother. The whole dynamic of the Romanov family changed the moment Alexei was born, because suddenly, those four girls very much became secondary to a whole focus on that precious, frail haemophiliac child. And the girls, immediately from a very young age, are sucked into this sense of caring and protecting, and cocooning Alexei. Alexei became incredibly precocious. His haemophilia meant that any knock or bump could trigger a potentially fatal bleed. Here, as his playmates launch themselves into the water, he is forced to watch from the safety of the pier.
After Alexei's birth, his parents guarded their family's privacy more fiercely than ever, determined that his hemophilia should remain in an absolute secret. And in 1905, the year after his birth, a new crisis drove the family even closer together, and isolated them still further from the outside world. Bloody Sunday, as it became known, was only the beginning of a year of revolutionary upheaval. And as the safety of the imperial family was called into question, their security was dramatically increased. After 1905, the imperial children rarely appeared in public. They were most likely to be spotted through the fence of the Alexander Park, playing in the palace grounds, where they had their own little house, on what was known as Children's Island. It was in the park, that Alexei, then age three, had his worst accident yet, when he fell and hurt his leg. He was in excruciating pain, and the doctor seemed unable to help. In desperation, the Tsarina turned to a mystical healer, Grigory Rasputin, who she had met a couple of years earlier. Rasputin had already made a name for himself as a mystic, and in the high society circles of St. Petersburg at that time, there was a search for mystical men, for some sort of spirituality. There were seances, Rasputin with his supernatural powers. His eyes. His charisma undoubtedly had a hold over aristocratic ladies, and indeed over some high churchmen, who recommended Rasputin to the Tsarina, and she genuinely believed, that he had mystical ability to cure, or at least relieve, the suffering of her son. Rasputin was a wandering pilgrim from Siberia, who came to St. Petersburg in 1903, and gained a reputation for his mystical powers. When he was first summoned to Alexei's sick bed, he simply prayed for the boy, and reassured him that his pain would go away. The next morning, his fever had gone, and the swelling in his leg had also disappeared. The encounter seemed to confirm Rasputin's remarkable abilities, to ease both Alexei's suffering, and the Tsarina's frayed nerves. It is well known, that particularly with pain and distress, and the interplay of pain in the child with distress, and emotional pain in the mother, for someone to enter the situation, and express in terms of great confidence that everything will be all right, it's sometimes extremely effective, if it works. According to some historians, Alexandra saw in Rasputin elements of what her grandmother saw in John Brown, the kind of noble savage. There was a brutal, rough, crude simplicity about Rasputin, as there was in John Brown. He had this peasant understanding about life and belief, in a way that was untrammeled by the sophistication of the world of St. Petersburg. She saw in him someone sent by God, to help them to save Alexei, to keep her boy alive. But Alexandra prided herself on her strict Victorian morals, and she knew that the family's relationship with Rasputin, was fraught with danger. For a start, his manners were notoriously bad. He was often drunk, and ate everything, even soup, with his hands. Worse than that, he was known to visit prostitutes, and to have had affairs with many of his female followers. It was not a reputation that sat easily with the imperial family's wholesome image. Alexandra was very aware of the gossip and scandal and innuendo, surrounding Rasputin, and she did not want that to attach to the family or to the girls. They kept his visits private, they didn't discuss them with other people. Therefore, the Tsarina instructed her daughters never to mention his name in public, or discuss him with others. He was their friend, their family confidant, and it stayed within the family. In 1909, the four daughters enjoyed a brief respite from the family self-imposed retreat at the Alexander Palace. That summer, Nicholas took his family to Britain, to visit King Edward VII, 
and their other royal relations during the cow's sailing regatta. Nicholas and the future George V's mothers were sisters, making the pair first cousins, and a striking family resemblance was clear. But this was not the average family holiday, and even well beyond the borders of his empire, the Tsar had to remain vigilant to the threat of assassination. The British royals, and in fact the British aristocracy, were absolutely horrified at the amount of security required to protect the Tsar of Russia. But there were so many threats against him. The future Edward VIII, who was quite a young man at the time, and was appointed to escort his royal cousins around, was absolutely horrified at the levels of security. But for the girls, the Isle of Wight provided a brief taste of the kind of freedom they would never be allowed within Russia. It was like being let out of jail. This was a whole new world, this outside life, as they later referred to it, that they had had no experience of, it was extraordinary. All of the children came ashore, to go shopping in West Cows, and look around the shops. But particularly Olga and Tatiana, with a little bit of pocket money, they were going around the shops, buying postcards, even of their own parents that were on sale on cows. It was such a revelation for those children to be allowed out. There is a delightful story of the two elder girls Olga and Tatiana escaping, not literally, because their guards were behind them, but they had some time off. And they did things like buying tickets for the ferry for themselves, which was a new experience for them. They'd never done that before. Other people would deal with money, or there would be no money anywhere. However, they couldn't keep it up for very long, because people began to realize who were those young ladies, walking around looking really pretty. They must have rather missed it when they came back. But it was a highlight for them, and it demonstrates how constrained normally their lives were. The trip to Cowes was the last time the two royal families would meet. From the glitz and glamour of Edwardian England, the girls returned to a life in Russia that was becoming ever more suffocating, and a childhood that was now blighted both by Alexei's and their mother's failing health. Alexandra had suffered from intense sciatica pain in the lower back since she was a teenager, and five pregnancies in quick succession had left her a physical wreck. When she returned home from cows, she was suffering from extreme exhaustion. In many photographs, Alexandra is often seen to be either lying down on her sofa in her bedroom, or sitting in a wheelchair, rarely moving around. She was basically an invalid. She suffered from palpitations, and it was believed that she had an enlarged heart. She had ear problems, migraines, she suffered from swollen legs, and from bouts of extreme exhaustion. And it wasn't just her physical ailments that incapacitated her. It was the huge and constant mental strain. 
First of all, worrying that her husband might be murdered or assassinated. Secondly, that her longed-for son could die at any time. Alexandra had always fought to preserve her daughter's innocence, but beneath their unruffled exteriors, private passions seethed. In December 1909, the 14-year-old Olga was in the grip of one of her first teenage crushes, on an officer in the imperial entourage. She poured out her heart to Rasputin. It's hard without you. I have no one to talk to. There is my torment. Nikolai is driving me crazy. I have only to go to the cathedral and see him, and my whole body shakes. I love him. I want to fling myself at him. You advise me to be cautious. But how can I be when I cannot control myself? The relationship of the four Romanov sisters with Rasputin clearly followed the parents' line. They saw him as a wise owl, a spiritual father, a teacher, someone even as young teenage girls could confide in. They wrote letters to him, asking his advice. They asked his advice about their teenage passions, they trusted him implicitly with a kind of total unworldly innocence. Among their Romanov relations, there was mounting concern about the exact nature of the relationship between four young and very innocent girls and Rasputin. In March 1910, Nicholas's mother and his two sisters heard that Rasputin had taken advantage of the two eldest sisters, Olga and Tatiana. There was an incident when their governess came to Nicholas and complained that Rasputin was actually in the bedroom of the girls, saying goodnight to them. Nicholas's mother was so concerned about her granddaughters and about the future of the Romanov line that she confided in the Prime Minister, Vladimir Kokostov. My poor daughter-in-law is ruining the dynasty and herself. She sincerely believes in the holiness of an adventurer, and we're powerless to ward off the misfortune that is sure to come. Rasputin dismissed all accusations, and there is no evidence that he was guilty of any abuse. But with the family's private life so shrouded in mystery, even the most outlandish rumors seemed all too plausible. In 1913, the Russian public enjoyed a rare sighting of their royals. That year's Romanov tercentenary demanded that the family show their faces, at a series of grand state occasions. For Nicholas and Alexandra, the tercentenary seemed to confirm that their long absence from public view had left their popularity undimmed, and the couple could not foresee the political storm threatening to engulf their family. At the time, none of the Romanov sisters would have realized it, but this was a volcano that was about to erupt so violently that it would destroy all trace of the world they knew. The second and last part of this series will trace the girls' lives through war and revolution. It will reveal how the war work of the girls finally gave them a taste of real life and real love beyond the palace gates. It will uncover the story of the sisters' final days in exile in Siberia, watching and waiting as the world closed in upon them.